You may be seated. Good morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Mary Beth Farrell. While St. Mark's may not be new to me, I've been gone for a little while, and I came back to, to be your latest priest. So I'm the new priest on the block. If I haven't met you yet, I look forward to doing so. And please come find me anytime. So what I realized today in preparing is that I'm not in the new priest shallow end anymore. Words like mocking and flogging, torture and persecution, to Jesus' words that he came with the sword and that families will be in conflict. With passages like this, we can avoid them, we can water them down, or we can lean in, trust the Spirit, and take Jesus' word for heart. This is my plan today. Let's pray. Almighty God, who became us to save us and who is always with us through your spirit, I ask for understanding and wisdom of your spirit for all those who gather today. In you and you only do I trust. Amen. So most of us are familiar with a three-point sermon, but today I'm gonna go a little bit rogue and do a seminary technique that we learned. It's pretty fancy. Point number one, what in the world is going on? Point number two, what in the world does this have to do with us today? So here we are in Luke. We've been in Luke for a while. And quite frankly, even though the words are jarring today, we heard them before. Simeon said, this child is destined to cause a falling and rising of many. Mary was told that a sword will pierce her too. And the words of Jesus towards his own family, my brothers and sisters are those who hear the word of God and do it. His own family had already felt the sword of division. It's also really important to understand that the people to whom Luke was writing lived under persecution and oppression. The cost of following Jesus had been made painfully clear. They learned that Pax Romana wasn't for them, and they learned to go along, to get along. So let's paint a little picture of Jesus here at this point. We have been told that the Pharisees had just begun to oppose him fiercely, focused on catching him in a lie. Adding to the intensity and urgency is that Jesus' future baptism is on the horizon. This is not the baptism by water, but the baptism of fire. The crucible of suffering in which what is not true and not of God will be burned away. For Jesus, he sees ahead to the time when he will suffer beyond what is imaginable and will die a horrific death. This is devastating, even for Jesus. And this knowledge has him stressed. So the word stressed bugged me just a little bit, so you uh, bear with me with a diversion. Other translations use the word constrained, and here the Greek is helpful. It means a narrow space, and it's used in military contexts. For example, a navy without room to maneuver or an army encamped in a narrow pass that can easily be ambushed. Add that to the description of thousands of people being trampled. All of that kind of get, gives me a visceral response. There's a lot going on there. Please know that his intense longing here is not to separate families or to cause hardship but to fulfill God's promises. We see that his tone becomes increasingly urgent. It's not a great example, but think about this. Perhaps when your child got their driver's license, 
and you're excited and you're encouraging him and you're thinking, I don't have to be a hockey mom or anything like that anymore. And maybe you're telling him he'll be a great driver and all that stuff. But in the next second, you might say, watch out for intersections and don't do that and don't do that. And so, you know, it's, this isn't Jesus here, but you kind of get this rhythm of the very hairs on your head are numbered. And then watch out, this is coming. So that might help a little bit with Jesus' tone. He's really trying to get their attention at this point. His tone becomes even more urgent, not for himself, but because he knows how much his disciples and followers will also suffer. And that breaks his heart. The reckoning is coming, it is beginning, and there are signs all around. What does all of this look like in another context? Perhaps one that is familiar to us, more familiar to us, in terms of time and place. For this, we go to Alabama, March of 1956, when the University of Alabama could no longer deny admission to persons because of their race. With the handing down of this decision, a brave young lady by the name of Arthur and Lucy became the first Negro student to be admitted in the history of the University of Alabama. This was a great moment. But with the announcement of this decision, the forces of evil began to congeal. As soon as she walked on the campus, a group of students and a vicious group of outsiders began threatening her on every hand. Crosses were burned, eggs and bricks were thrown at her. The mob jumped on top of the car in which she was riding. Finally, the president and trustees of the university asked Althorin to leave for her own safety and the safety of the university. The next day, after she was dismissed, the paper came out with this headline, things are quiet in Tuscaloosa today. There is peace on the campus of the University of Alabama. I now quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, things are quiet in Tuscaloosa. Yes, there was peace on the campus, but it was peace at a great price. It was peace that had been purchased at the price of allowing mobocracy to reign supreme over democracy. It was peace that had been purchased at the price of capitulating to the force of darkness. This is the type of peace that all men and women of goodwill hate. It is the type of peace that is obnoxious. It is the type of peace that stinks in the nostrils of Almighty God. Peace is not merely the absence of some negative force, war, tensions, confusion, but it is the presence of some positive force, justice, goodwill, the power of the kingdom of God. If peace means accepting second-class citizenship, I don't want it. If peace means keeping my mouth shut in the midst of injustice and evil, I don't want it. If peace means complacently adjusted to a deadening status quo, I don't want peace. In a passive, nonviolent manner, we must revolt against this peace. Jesus says in substance, I will not be content until justice, goodwill, brotherhood, love, yes, the kingdom of God is established upon the earth. This is real peace. Peace is the presence of positive good. In here I hear, in this section I hear, no justice, no peace. So where is the hope in all of this? Jesus says that he wishes that it had already began. Why? Because our Lord, our Lord knows what is on the other side. Jesus knows that death and suffering have been, are, and will be conquered forever. That God's promises of healing, of justice, and of peace will all be fulfilled. 
we see beautiful and tender imagery embedded throughout the hard words. Jesus loves us so much, he knows every hair in our heads. He tells us not to be afraid. He calls us a little flock, and he assures us we will not be alone. In a way, it's like Jesus knows how the movie will end. It is really poignant to watch a movie with someone who hasn't seen a movie before and doesn't know that it's going to be okay. It is particularly sweet to watch children look out for each other. It's okay, just wait, it's okay, wait, it's okay, she's going to come back. They can't hold it in. So I have to confess that we pharaohs are particularly fond of the princess bride. And we don't think it's weird at all that we know every single line. Anyway, the relief and joy of learning that there is a difference between mostly dead and dead dead. Amazing, spectacular. It's a good lens, isn't it? I am also a lover of Narnia tales, mainly the books. But the scene of Aslan's resurrection and in Prince Caspian, when Lucy finds him alive and says, Aslan, it's you. Aslan, it's you. It's you. But there's another piece of hope, friends, and that's our job. Our job is not to turn a blind eye. Our job is not to say peace when there is no peace. Our job is to be there for those who are on the margins, for those who suffer every day and keep the peace because they are afraid. What might the Spirit be saying to us this morning? What might the Spirit be saying to you this morning? Let us pray. God of love, who loves us with a radical, reckless, and irrevocable love, empower us to do the same to others. God of peace, who calls us to peace that is not of this world, may we bring your peace to this world in desperate need. We give you all that we are and all that we have. Amen.